Take two. Try that again. Hi, I'm Paul Salantano. I uh, always wanted to work on cars ever since I was a kid. I wanted to work on my dad's cars and he knew better. So we have one coming in. Come on in. I'm not really signed up. I just come on, in. Oh, come on in. And, oh, uh, here comes trouble. So my father uh, figured, well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll nip this in the bud, and he gives me the service manual for the 63 Dodge, thick as a phone book. He says, here, read this, kid. And um, I did. <laughs> so I read from cover to cover, but he still wouldn't let me work on the cars, and, and rightly so. But anyway, um, I like working on the cars. I save a lot of money working on them. I don't have to buy new cars. I never had to make a car payment in my life, and I get really low insurance for that reason. So. We're here today to learn about the um, different uh, the, the uh, maintaining the car. We're going to concentrate on the maintenance items in the car. Uh, three things that all the systems need. They need one or more of the following. Fluids, filters, and gases. That's it. Sounds like a Medicare plan. So, uh, I mean, you know, you gasoline is a fluid. The water, the coolant for the engine to keep it cool. The oil, the air all coolants. The power steering has a coolant. The air conditioner has a gas called Freon. Uh, the brake system is, is all hydraulic and fluids. Um, what did they say? Filters, of course, everybody's got a filter nowadays. Like even the cabin, the passenger compartment has a filter. And um, so I guess we'll go over first is uh, the engine. We, we have um, a chart here with, um, not a chart, but um, an outline here of the different systems, the major systems in the automobile. First one, of course, is the engine. There's a cutaway of an engine there. All you need to know is the oil, as we know, they need oil. You need oil changes. Uh, refer to your owner's manual about how often uh, and with what kind of oil to change it. And that can depend on um, operating conditions and uh, even the weather. So they have sometimes I'll have two recommendations for two different types of uh, oils. Uh, the thicker oils, the less thicker oils. They, they call them the SAEs. You might have like 520 versus uh, 1020. And, um, and they'll give you a chart for one and a chart for the other. And one's like rated for Alaska and one's rated for Georgia. And we live in Pennsylvania, which doesn't have its own climate. We just get everybody else's bad weather. So you kind of have to flow with it. If you're driving around in the desert a lot, um, your oil and everything else will get full of contaminants. Uh, the oils they make nowadays are the synthetic oils. Uh, they claim you can go 5,000 miles between oil changes. Toyota dared to say 10,000 miles between oil changes, and they wound up buying new engines for their customers because um, they thought, <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but they're idiots. I own one of those cars now, but <laughs> um, the, uh, I tend, I don't care, you know, unless you're doing a lot of highway mileage, I change mine every 3,000 miles, and I have not had an oil related failure in any of my engines. I have a Geo Metro with 313,000 miles on it, runs like brand new, and it doesn't burn a drop. So we're all familiar with the dipstick. Mm -hmm. All right, so first thing you do is park it level, because if you don't, then the dipstick goes in here, and the oil's tilted like this, you're going to get a bad read. You're going to be too high or too low. Um, you know, park level side to side, park it level front to rear. Um, wipe, the, wipe the stick down several times, because the newer oils tend to cling on the sticks very weird. Um, you don't get a good reading all the time. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, this car still has a steel um, dipstick. This came out of my focus. I might have put it in before I go home. And um, <laughs> the, uh, so maybe we can walk around. I guess you know that, uh, well, I'll, I'll do this. It has two holes here. And between the two holes, there's a hatch mark. And on this particular one, the two holes, you may not have holes on yours. But that's the safe zone. Anything below that, you got to add oil. You don't want to go over it, because if you do, and this guy's spinning around and it churns the oil up, you're going to get foam everywhere and um, bad things will happen. You're going to get oil where it doesn't belong. Um, if, like I said, every 3,000 miles, uh, you should check it often, depending on how old your car is. People, like my nieces and my kids, they like, why don't I have to check it? We just, you know, we just filled it up. We just changed the oil. Well, it's not leaking oil. It never uses oil. Yeah, but someday it's gonna. And so, and when it does, then you can say, well, you know, between two Phillips, I gotta add a little oil. So it's just good to poke around the hood often. Um, with the oil comes a filter. Anybody here plan on changing your own for oil? Maybe, okay. I'll show you the latest and greatest filters that just came out with. So, since I was a kid, where did I put that? We use an oil filter wrench, 
and it's a strap wrench, and as you would turn it, it would grab the filter. Now, this one's too big. I don't, this must be from my big old V8 cars. I have smaller ones. The problem is, the newer cars is really tight spaces. You can't get in there. You can short this up against electrical connections, which is going to be a bad day. And um, to spin it off or to tighten it on, um, and uh, even with the smaller ones, they just don't seem to grip them well in these tight spaces. So what I've been doing is I've been buying this brand is K and N. That's a weird name. They have a hex on the end of it, so you can get a wrench on a thing, a real wrench, and really grab it, and it come right out. So it costs about four dollars extra more than a regular one, but it saved me hours on the Honda Civic because the Honda Civic was just ridiculously stupid where they put that filter. Um, any questions about oil? I guess I'm never quite sure if I'm looking at the reading, if I'm reading it right. You know, there you go. Right if it's, that. I mean, I know what you're saying about the, the, the two dots, right. know, the two holes, and you want it between the two holes. But I was wondering if, what, if I add some oil, if I'm going to make it too high. Oh, okay. Uh, rule of thumb, I've never seen a car be any different than this rule of thumb. The distance between the whole two holes equals one quart. So if it's halfway between the two, add a half a quart, and I'll bring it up to full. If it's right at the add line, you know the, the lowest limit, add one quart carefully, and you know have a magic marker and write something under the hood in case it is kind of different than the rule of thumb. But that's the rule of thumb. I think uh, that sometimes I'll stamp it on here. Now they didn't. They'd probably save two and a half cents per vehicle by not stamping that on here. It used to tell you add one quart. Uh, any other questions about them? Okay, we'll move on to charging, which is batteries, alternators, belts and pulleys. Um, so you need the battery to um, um, spin the engine to get it started. Yeah, um, where did I put the remote? It's, it's there. Oh, this thing? Okay, yep. neat. Down to go forward. Let's see, we're done with the engine. We're done with the, you don't care about that. Spark plugs. We might go, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, we might go back to this spark plugs. So you got the battery located here. We've seen that big black box with the big O2 terminals on there. Now let me give you a little warning about the new batteries on the new cars. They have things called smart alternators. So, well, let me back up. All right, so the battery, you turn the key, it spins this electric motor, which engages to the flywheel on the engine, spins the engine, you hear the engine fire, you let go of the key, and off you go. I'm not gonna get into the ones where you push button and start the hybrids. We're not talking about that. Right? I will never own one those things. So you don't even know if they're running. So um, now you've drained the battery a little bit. You gotta run headlights, you gotta run your blower, you gotta run your turn signals, and of course the huge hi-fi system you custom installed. The battery's not gonna last forever, so they have an alternator right here. The engine spins the belts, spins the alternator, generates electricity, charges the battery, um, and everybody's happy. So um, Things about the battery is they have acid in them, and there's, you can take the caps off on some of them and see if the acid level is proper. The modern cars, I don't see them evaporating water anymore. By the way, you should wear gloves. Otherwise, you'll be picking skin off your fingers and, and you can go blind from it, too. Um, you notice um, this one goes down to the frame. That's the negative one on this car, anyway. The positive one goes all over the place to all your different electrical systems. If you Put a metal object on a positive one and you touch any part of the metal of the car it'll vaporize that wrench in your face and you'll see a ball of sparks about the size of half the size of this room I've seen it happen one of the most dangerous things you can do is jump vehicles and on the new cars it's really getting ugly because they have a thing called a smart alternator which apparently when you floor the car it turns the alternator off so you get five more horsepower out of it who cares they do it anyway and you, and you never want to jump a smart alternator unless you read the manuals. I haven't, haven't gotten my hands on them yet because my cars aren't that new yet. And you can tell that it's a smart alternator because they're going to have all this electronic junk on top of the battery. Just walk away from it, call the tow truck, let him blow it up, it's his insurance. Um, the other thing you can do when you're jumping a vehicle, whether you're jumping a vehicle or you're getting jumped, is um, at least on the Chevy Impalas, you will blow up the radio. Turn the radio off before you jump the car. Now, who cares? It's a radio. Well, the problem with that is a lot of the uh, smart stuff to run the car goes through the radio. For some reason, they made 
that part of the smart part of the car on that 2000 Impala. And in fact, it got jumped, and it was before I owned it. And my niece like pretty much abandoned the car in my driveway, and I didn't have a job. And I figured, well, let's fix this thing up. And um, the battery kept going dead. I had no idea why. And one day I listened, uh, I got in the car and I heard the speakers going whoop, 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 whoop. Because the, the vehicle had been jumped with the radio on, the radio got fried, went crazy, and would constantly whoop, whoop, whoop the speakers and drain the battery. That, that radio went bye-bye. Um, so yeah, dangerous and screwy with these things. So things with uh, the batteries is, um, the two terminals here get corroded because you're dealing with a lot of battery acid and stuff. You want to keep the top of the battery clean, just wipe it down, wear gloves, um, wear goggles. Um, and uh, I, by the way, I didn't go through the disclaimer. I'm not telling you how to work on them. I'll tell you how to, I'm not going to tell you how to take them apart. Um, vehicles have dangers of every kind, including but not limited to burns, crushing, moving parts, sharp pointy objects, poison gases, poison fluids, acid burns. You're going to get acid burns on that. Uh, chemical burns, high pressure uh, hazards. Chemical freezes, spring-loaded devices posing risks for eye and other injuries, electrical shocks. Are you scared? Oh well, buy a horse, just make sure you don't get kicked. So it's a dangerous world out there, what are you going to do? Um, so the alternator um, has to charge that battery. So getting back to these terminals, if you dare go to clean these things, what you want to do is you want to disconnect the negative one first. Just don't short those two out, you will vaporize the tool. And then disconnect the, the positive one. I won't go into why, but when you go back to putting it together, you put the negative, you put the positive on first and the negative on last. And I'll, I'll tell you why. The reason why is once you disconnect that negative terminal, and then you go to touch the positive terminal, the car is no longer negatively charged, and you're less apt to have that wrench slip and blow things up. So before you jump start a car, you're supposed to undo those. Oh no, 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 I'm just talking about cleaning the terminals. Oh, okay. If you're going to clean, yeah. When you jump the car, they should be on there. They, it could be the reason why the car won't start is the terminals are corroded. We're going to get in that in a second. Oh, okay. And um, at that point, uh, I will clean the terminals before I'll bother jumping the car. Um, sometimes just clean the terminals and make the car start. I've seen that happen. And that was one camping trip that did, did not get ruined by um, the Scoutmaster's car. It had like big green globs of corrosion on there. It was hilarious. Um, so what you want to do is, um, I got a couple things here. There it is. After you clean the terminals with the terminal cleaning tool, which should be in here. There it is. Take the terminals off. Sometimes they break, and you know you're just gonna have a bad day. It's called a battery terminal cleaner. It's got like a wire brush in here. It goes over the post. This one needs to be replaced. Um, it goes over the post, like let's pretend that's the battery post, and it scrubs it. When you pull these cables off, they have to fit over the post. So what do they have? They have a hole. So you take the battery terminal cleaner apart, and you put that in the uh, cable ends. They get like big eye connectors, and then you can scrub them out. Um, Put them all back together. I wipe them down with paper towels and everything else because you're never going to get it all off with the brush. And a uh, battery terminal protector, I'll spray both of them uh, with this stuff. And it keeps them from corroding in the future. I won't say it keeps them from corroding. It helps keep them from corroding. Nothing keeps anything from doing anything. So that's battery care. Acid level, keep the terminals clean. Don't jump them unless you really, really know what you're doing. Um, the alternator has to charge the battery, so it's done with that belt. And with the belt come other problems. Let's see. So here we have a belt. And so the, the modern belts, they're not the V-shaped anymore. They have these grooves in them. And you can see this belt, if you look down in the engine compartment, you can probably look down and see those grooves. You're not going to really see them wear on these things. You might see them getting cracks going across the grooves. And that means it's time. How these things wear out is the, the bumps on the grooves wear. So if you were to look at the same profile and you were to see the grooves, you see like the peak of a groove like this. And over time, they, they, it wears and it gets thinner and thinner. So the grooves, you know, the, the ridges, I should say, aren't as wide. So they don't wedge into the pulley, which has amazing grooves in it as well. And you'll tend to hear them squeal once in a while. And that's why. 
Um, so you'll look, you'll be listening. It's not everything that you see, too. It's listening. If, they, if that bell squeals once in a while, it could be your bell squaring out. It could be some other problems, too. These pulleys may not be aligned. And the reason why they won't be aligned would be, I got one. While I'm looking for that, always keep an empty water bottle in your trunk. Because you can take the bottom off of it, slice it with a razor blade or anything else, and it's now a funnel. And I'll get in tight spots and you can squeeze them and crunch them up. And it may take a long time to get the whatever it is you're trying to refill, but it will get you home, as we like to say. Um, there was a pulley in here. I know there was. Yeah, there's a few other things in here, too. Ah, here it is. So, this one came out of the daughter's Camry over the summer after the water pump blew up. So I knew it needed a water pump. But I also noticed that this pulley, once I got the belts off it, got the tension off of it, it had some place. This pulley's kind of wobbling. And it doesn't take much. Wobble, they'll squeal, and they'll also throw the bolt, the belt off. And then you're done. Because they got one, bolt, uh, one belt that runs the whole show on the cars nowadays. You don't, have, you don't have the fan belt and the water pump belt and the power steering belt in the air. It's all one belt nowadays. Um, this one, you can see, is smooth. Um, that means the groove side of the belt does not go on that. Generally, it'd be something like this, where the back side of it will be on that surface. If it had grooves in it, of course, the grooves side of the belt would go on it. So the things you look for in there, if, if you look at this pulley, see how nice and shiny that is? Even though it had some wobble, it wasn't doing too bad. If you get a lot of wobble in these things, they start getting like, like uh, you know when the airplanes, they land on the, on the runway, and they leave all the skid marks and grime and junk at the end of the right? It'll look like that on this thing. And then you get bumps in on it, and it'll start jumping and chattering the belt, and off it goes. And I got to tell you, it's no fun changing the belts out on the Long Island Expressway in the snow. Been there, done that. Um, so things to look for here: the belt squealing, the belts having cracks in them. You're not going to see if those grooves are wearing. You're not going to see it. And look for the pulleys to see if they got those uh, black marks from the belt wearing off on them. Um, move on to the next thing. There's uh, fuel pump and injectors. Let's see. Look here. Okay, oh, can I ask one question about the wrong batteries? Direction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you can you uh, jump start a hybrid? Uh, I wouldn't know. Never owned one. Never played with one, and that would definitely be something for the you know. I wouldn't even look at. Well, look at the owner's manual. They'll tell you whether okay. you should or not. Um, I don't even know how those things work really. I, I know I understand the theory behind them. I've never really torn into the goings on and those things. Hey, that's going to get complicated now because, uh, you know, we got fuel injection now, and that was a big quantum leap from the carburetors, but now you get the hybrids, and now you got all the all electrics, and um, you're going to, I mean, you're going to need a team of mechanics in a garage and come soon. Um, let's see, this is a fuel system. Okay, fuel systems are a lot more complicated than they ever used to be because instead of having a mechanical fuel pump on the engine itself, which you always knew would go bad because we would always spurt gasoline out of them. For some reason, that was a warning sign and that was acceptable to have gasoline spray out of the fuel pump. It was called a weep hole. So if the diaphragm went bad, it would leak out through the diaphragm and spurt out, and that's how you diagnosed it. And that was considered normal. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's a very highly sealed system. Um, you have an electric fuel pump that goes in your tank, which, by the way, that alternator has to generate enough power for that. Oh, and if you do, if you're driving and see a red light comes on the battery, light comes on while you're driving, that means your alternator's dead, and you got about a mile to go before you run out of battery and you're dead in the water. So find a place that parks quickly when that happens. Um, so it's an electric fuel pump that is submersed in the fuel tank, which is kind of scary, and um, it pumps the fuel at a rather high pressure. So these things here called fuel injectors, and instead of having a carburetor where it would just kind of drip the uh, gasoline into the intake on the engine. Um, it uh, pumps it and sprays it in there. And, so, and these fuel injectors are nothing more than glorified uh, squirt guns. And they're controlled by the computer, and the computer tells it how long to squirt. 
the gasoline. The longer the squirt, the more fuel you get in there. If the engine is, the, the computer knows if you're trying to ask for more power because there's a thing in there called a throttle sensor. It knows how far you're putting the gas pedal down and various other things. Um, there is a fuel filter buried under your car someplace. Years ago, you'd routinely replace them every year or so. Now you almost never do. You probably should. It's probably in your owner's manual to do so. I have never replaced one in my, any of my cars. <laughs> I'm asking for trouble, I guess. That clogs up. What'll happen uh, on the computerized cars nowadays is um, you just you'll start losing power. It might quit altogether. It just won't be able to push enough fuel in there to you know get up a hill. Um, the fuel pumps go bad. They'll do that too. You'll find um, that when the fuel pumps wear out, they have a propeller in them. Like, a, like an impeller. If you ever took a vacuum cleaner apart, you see that little fan blade thingy they got inside the vacuum cleaners? We've all had Hoover for uprights, right? No? Okay. So, um, they, the, they're made of plastic and it wears away, and the, you don't get the fuel pump pressure. And the symptom of that is it's not getting up hills, it's starving for fuel, because that's when you need a lot of fuel to get up the hills. Brother in law got stranded out in the west someplace with a trailer, a camper trailer, doing that. And back then, uh, we thought that was such a stupid problem because you know, we never heard fuel pumps failing that way back then. But that's in the modern era. And um, the fuel cap, of course, is important. If your check engine light comes on, check your fuel cap. Sometimes if they're loose, this whole system is sealed. It has sensors in it, and it, it knows when you have air leaks in the system. Um, you have things in there called vacuum hoses, like this guy, and he might just be attached somewhere and it allows the fuel vapor to go someplace and go through a charcoal filter and get recycled. That way the vapors don't get out into the environment. And you get a little tiny little hole in this thing. This computer is going to pick up on it and drive you nuts because it's going to throw a code. The check engine light comes on and kill this. And um, turn this thing off. Thank you. Um, I just had a car. I could not find a vacuum leak. I just couldn't find it. And I took it to the shop because what they do is they'll inject smoke into all the vacuum lines and they go all over the whole car and they wait for the smoke to come out of the lungs that's leaking. I said, there it is. It's called a smoke machine. And that was worth it. That cost me about 135 bucks. If you can get out of the shop for 135 bucks, you're, 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 you're walking tall. Um, if you don't use your car a lot, your gas is going to go bad. It's going to get water vapor in there. Best to keep it full if you're not going to use it a lot. There are probably a few additives out there that you can use. Um, best just to drive a car. Cars hate just sitting around. They don't like that at all. Any questions about fuel systems? Right. Um, so you get the fuel into the engine, and the engine needs sparks to make it happen. So you have the ignition system. So let's go look at Mr. Spark Plug here. That's in here. That I know. I'm not sure he's managed each part. This guy. We need that. And this part of the box. There he is. So. That's not this fine remote. I don't know which one's up or down. I think this is down. System. Yeah, there we go. Um, you're not going to see them looking, looking like this too much anymore, but the uh, principle is the same. So let's go back to how that used to work. And that is, um, well, it still works. You still have spark plugs. Unless, you know, hybrids are going to happen too because they have a gasoline engine in them. Uh, diesels don't. they got another set of rules. Um, electric cars obviously don't. I had a kid, the guy at our work who has a Tesla, asking him what he's doing for an oil change. You know? <laughs> so, uh, he's my boss, so. I don't know if you can see that, but right there is a tiny little gap. So you have the, the body of it, you have the white one, just do it this way. There we go. See that tiny little gap? That's only 44 thousandths of an inch of a gap. That's only 44 thousandths. Back in the day, it used to be 35 thousandths, but they couldn't, the ignition systems couldn't get the spark to jump that far. So they came up with a higher voltage sparks, and they can jump 44 thousandths of an inch, which means the length of that spark is 10 thousandths more of an inch longer, which means it's more likely to explode the gasoline, which is the whole point. Um, 
So these sparks have to happen at just the right moment when the gasoline's in there and the compression's there. You all know how the, the pistons go up and down and it's got to be just in the right place. If it goes off too early, it's, it's going to explode the gasoline too early while the intake valve is still open and it will blow out the carburetor or the top of the engine and it will backfire. And if it sparks too late, it will go out the back end. But um, you don't have that problem anymore. It's all computer controlled. Um, it used to be that you had these wires. Each one of these wires would go to a different spark plug and each, each cylinder had a spark plug. That's an eight cylinder engine. It's got four cylinders on this side. You can see the four uh, connectors, the spark plug boots. And it had four on the other side. And so what would happen is this cable would get connected to it. There's nice and pretty in orange. This is from a Geo Metro. You don't get anything nice from a Geo Metro. And then it would go, I just made a mess. Um, so this guy, that's called the distributor, and it would plug in there, and the distributor would have one wire would come in the center here, and it would distribute the spark to the three different wires coming out of it. That's why it's called a distributor. And why does this thing only have three? Because it's a Geo Metro. Um, this little guy in here was the rotor. He'd spin around with the engine, he'd be timed to the engine, and it would just hit each wire and spin around and bam, 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 hit the cylinders all at the right time. They got rid of all this. It's all gone now. They have a thing called a coil pack. And, oh, by the way, the belts should get changed every so many thousand miles before they start squeaking. I know this is maintenance. I'm getting, I'm going off the rails here with concept, not, not maintenance. Coil pack. So each spark plug has a coil pack. They're like 70 bucks a piece. This is $3. I don't know. <laughs> What's the point, right? Uh, this one's bad. This one's still warm. I changed it out Saturday night. Um, and what they do is they create the high voltage. They get a signal from the computer, and there's a magic piece of electronics in there that'll, that'll uh, send the very, very high voltage, like 60,000 volts into the spark plug and make the spark. So they don't need these wires anymore because it goes in there like that. Now, um, the cool thing about not having that wire and that cap and rotor, well, the cap and rotor is mechanical. We all know what happens to them. They wear out. But, you know, for three bucks, you just change it out in an afternoon. So it used to be in maintenance when you had caps and rotors, you would change out the cap and rotor maybe once a year or so many thousand miles, and you'd change out these spark plug wires when your engine would misfire. So you have, how would you know? Well, it misfired. You could look at these wires at night. It's like I said, there's like 60,000 volts going through them. And if the insulation starts leaking, you can see little lightning bolts flying out of it. And every time you see one fly out, you'll hear the engine miss because the spark's not going to the plug. So if you have an older car, a maintenance thing would be to look under the hood at night in the dark, see if any, see any arcs coming off of these things. Uh, don't get your hair tangled up in there. The other thing to do is grab it with your hand and then your neighbors are going to hear you scream because it does hurt. I have been bitten with it from that wire right there, right through a leather glove. I found the problem because <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't lightning bolts yet. Um, so on your ignition system, things to look for. If you have a cabin rotor, get it changed out often. Um, if you don't, there's really nothing to them. Um, if it starts missing, it's going to throw a code, the engine light comes on, and it might just be one of these $60 items. Um, a four-cylinder engine is going to have four of these, one for each cylinder. That's a lot of money to change out all four of them. Like I said, we used to change out all four spark plugs, you know, and, and a cap and rotor and think nothing of it. But these things, I wait till they break. They cost too much. Um, the one thing uh, else that can happen is the ceramic on the spark plug and get micro cracks in it and just get little lightning bolts coming out of them. You won't see them in a modern engine, they're buried in where you can't see them. So, every 100,000 miles, they recommend replacing the spark plugs. So that's, that's one, the one maintenance item is still on the um, um, uh, modern engine. For the ignition system, um, the uh, spark plugs will wear down. Now, i got to tell you, I had an Impala that went 179,000 miles on it. I bought a set of spark plugs on it, and I tried getting them out, the old ones out. I said, forget it. We're not doing this. It's not going to happen. Even if I had it on a lift, you couldn't get there from here. Um, 
And uh, luckily, the, the engine just blew up one day because it was old. And we had the factory original spark plugs in there for 179,000. I had a Chrysler minivan. I changed them out because they weren't too bad. At about 130,000 miles, and I pulled them out, and they look fine. I mean, th this one looks good. Uh, years ago, they get all crudded up with carbon. Engines are so clean now; they don't leave all those carbon deposits you used to hear about. Remember, that they used to try to sell us the clean gasoline and all that. It's a carburetor; it's going to produce soot. You know, fuel injection, it's soda pop coming out of there. So, all right. Uh, any question about ignitions and maintenance? Basically, um, if it says every hundred thousand miles, if you have money burning a hole in your pocket, get it done. But, um, you know, does everybody here have a car older than two thousand ten? You're all rich people. That's <laughs> 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 like. You know, if you have a car that's that old or older, you better be buying tools because it's going to cost you to have it done. It's a hundred bucks an hour in shop now. So, uh, emissions, uh, EGR valve, fuel vapor management, catalytic converter, nah, O2 sensors. All right, the catalytic converter is part of the exhaust system. There's no maintenance there. Let sleeping dogs lie. If it throws a code and it tells you the CO2 sensor, it probably isn't. It's probably that vacuum leak. Uh, that's the thing about those engine codes. So I have one of these. So when you get the check engine light, it could be anything. It could be a loose gas cap, it could be um, you know, a big hole in one of the pistons in the cylinders, who knows. You all seen these, the handheld scanners. You plug it into the bottom of the car and under the dash. This one cost me about $175. It had some of the bells and whistles I wanted. The next one up had some of the bells and whistles I could probably live without and didn't want to spend the extra money. It'll tell you what the code is. You look up the code, it says, oh, well, it says like um, number three cylinder misfire, which is what condemned this guy. Well, I've seen that one before, and I've seen that car before, and I knew right away it was this, one, this guy right here. I'm sure enough it was. Um, and um, so it'll tell you exactly which cylinder is misfiring. So, uh, it might say the O2 sensor is stuck running lean. Well, throw it, get, put a new O2 sensor in there, right? Well, that's like a hundred bucks to get it yanked out at least. Probably another hundred fifty for it. So now you got two fifty. Oh, the, the light's still on. Well, because it had nothing to do with the O2 sensor, it was probably it could have been a vacuum leak, sucking in extra air, making the engine run lean. The computer sees, hey, I'm running lean. Throw a O2 sensor code because it's the O2 sensor that's telling you if it's running lean or not. Don't always take them literally. Read between the lines. A uh, good mechanic will. Uh, they also have better, better machines that do very much more fancy things than this can ever do, but they cost $20,000. I'm not buying one of those. Um, so as for the emissions, you have the um, you know, the whole entire exhaust system, which is the catalytic converter, two O2 sensors. Uh, the gas cap is considered part of the emissions. Um, the PVC valve, I don't think I have one of those with me. Um, that used to be a common thing too, but like I said, the modern cars are so clean burning now, you know, gum up the insides of the moving parts, and um, that's why you're getting 200,000 miles out of an engine now. And remember back in the day, if you got 100,000 miles, you were like a legend in the neighborhood. You know, now it's, you know, it's a good used car. If you ever went 100,000, that's probably a good car. Um, so there's really no maintenance on the O2, uh, on the uh, exhaust, other than if you hear it. Um, Leaking, yeah, get it checked. You will die otherwise. Um, the uh, if you see the pipes hanging down, that's not a good thing either. They they have parts that rust out on them. I just replaced the entire system on my 2004 Focus, but you guys don't own anything at all. So they're all stainless steel now, and they last a long time. Um, let's see if we have any decent slides for emissions anyway. Uh, yeah, so there's your fuel tank, and it gives the fuel tank is going to have vapors in it. And you have to let the vapors go someplace, otherwise the fuel tank will look like a puffer fish. So they vent it into a canister, and the vapors reliquify and goes through all kinds of crazy plumbing parts, and comes back and it gets recirculated into the fuel tank, and doesn't evaporate into the uh, atmosphere. Um, as you can see, they have a purge control unit, and there's some engine vacuum in there that'll suck in the vapors, and there's a purge valve and a PVC valve, and all kinds of go goofy stuff that is mechanical. It will go bad, and um, throw codes on your, uh, you know, check engine light will throw code. I'll tell you another thing too, though. When you're under the hood, 
you see, these are all a bunch of rubber hoses, and this could be a vacuum hose. This could be there could be coolant in that went through this, which. By the way, that's what this really was. It was a coolant hose. It wasn't a vacuum hose. I just faked you out earlier. Um, there could be these fuel vapor lines or fuel, it could be liquefied fuel pressure lines or fuel return lines. Go to the hood. They should be nice and soft and springy. Um, this one I don't think was leaking, but the one next to it was. And I figured, well, if you're in there tearing the system apart, replace the one next to it to replace them all, shotgun it, because why do it twice? And um, you, know, you had to drain all the fluid out, you know. And um, and uh, you can gently look, bend them and look for cracks. I mean, just see if they're not getting rotten on you. Look for leaks. Look for leaks around where the clamps are. And if they are leaking where the clamps are, uh, the first thing you do, now that's the wrong clamp for this hose, obviously. Did I bring that radiator hose? Yes, I did. Uh, that would be a more fitting Thing. We'll get into the cooling system later. But that's a nice new shiny one. But if it's all rusted and rotten and it doesn't turn tightly, you know, if you want, you know, give it a tweak. Don't break it. Do these things in your driveway or right in front of the mechanic shop, you know. Um, it's the great thing about living in Phoenixville. Anybody here live in Phoenixville? Okay. We have like three auto parts stores in this town, two hardware stores, and we used to have a Sears. Unfortunately, they're gone. Um, so, uh, I would never move out of this town for the reason that I can walk anywhere I need, no matter what went bad in my car in the driveway. So anyway, check your hoses and clamps. Um, that's the maintenance for anything like emissions, cooling systems, uh, fuel systems. Uh, there are even brake hoses. We'll touch on them later too. So what do you need to do for your emission system? Just look under the hood once in a while. You'll be surprised if you look under the hood, you might just find things that are wrong. I was uh, just adding oil in my daughter's car today, and I noticed a wire connector, not a connector, but it was holding the cable in place so it wouldn't wander off and get destroyed. It just wasn't anchor properly. Just popped it back on. Just poke around in there. Your eyes will see things that just don't look right. Um, any questions about the fuel system besides not getting water in them? Um, not a big fan of additives, unless you absolutely positively have to. Uh, cooling system, okay. Cooling system does two things. Um, we all know what antifreeze is, right? Cheap liquor. No, just kidding. <laughs> Don't drink it. It's poison. It's, and I'm surprised too, because I had to siphon some out, because I overfilled the system once. And I did siphon. I'll never do it again. Because they say, you know, if you swallow it, you, you, you know, I figured, you know, I thought I maybe got some in my mouth, and I'm spitting it out, and it's like, you know, this is kind of scary. I wonder how bad it really is. I looked it up. It does not take much to kill you. Uh, do not do that. Do not do what I did. Uh, get, get an eyedropper and if you overfill it. You know? But anyway, um, so it does a couple of things. It cools the engine. That's why they call it coolant. And it also provides you heat for your heater. So let's talk about cooling the engine first. It will, um, there's a water pump in there. It circulates the water around. Uh, the, I, you'll hear me call it water because back in my day we didn't use antifreeze all the time. Um, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta use antifreeze. And it absorbs the heat inside the engine block and sends it out through the radiator hoses, which by the way, hey, this one's brand new. I think this car got wrecked before. No, this car, why did we get done? Yeah, the frame rotted out right before I put this in. So, you know, well, um, this one's brand new, but you know, check them to make sure you can squeeze them, make sure they're nice and soft. If they're hard, or if they're getting like spider cracks in them, it's time to replace them. Get it, you know, either do it yourself or get someone to replace it. When they do it, they're going to dump the old antifreeze out. They're going to probably want to replace a thing called a thermostat, which is a good idea because you see that radiator hose goes from the thermostat into the radiator. It goes into the radiator, which is it's a radiator. It's got little thin, thin tubes in it where the coolant goes through the thin tubes. That allows air to flow over the tubes, and the air is transferred from the coolant into the air. It goes back into the engine here, into the water pump, and circulated around and around and around it goes. The thermostat controls the temperature. They're usually set to about 195 degrees. So when your coolant reaches 195 degrees, it allows it to go into the radiator because the engines like having warm water. They like to be around 195 degrees, all the sensors, all the operating, all the tuning, uh, and all the computers are all programmed around 195 degrees. That's why back in our day, 
it was so hard to get them started and get them to run. Um, and that's why if you're running a cold engine all the time, your gas miles goes way downhill because the computers just, they just dump fuel in there to keep it running. So um, if you get a hose replaced, they're going to have to expose the fluid, drain it out, replace the fluid. They're probably going to want to replace that uh, thermostat um, while they're in there because the thermostats actually will go bad. There's a chemical in them that wears out. Uh, they might recommend putting in new hoses of, on other places too, such as this thing called a bypass hose. That's a little tiny hose that you can look for cracks on too. And then the heater hoses go from the water pump to your heater. We'll talk about that in a second. And there's your heater control valve. So what? The heater hoses leak. What happens? Well, it's the same cooling system that's in your engine and your heater could lose fluid, but your car loses fluid. You run the coolant low, the engine overheats. Back in the day, it wasn't a big deal. Nowadays, it will ruin them. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. So you want to check your hoses for cracks and whatnot. Of course, there's the water pump that's run by the belt. Um, there's the radiator cap. Never, ever remove that radiator cap when the engine is even close to being warm. I mean, if you, that engine has to be stone cold before it's safe to re uh, remove that cap. You remove the cap, you can look in there, you can see the condition of the coolant. It should be, not have white sludgy foam in it. It shouldn't look like a dog's rat, rabid mouth, you know. Um, it should be relatively clear, not cloudy. Um, those are indications of uh, cross-contamination with the oil in the engine, which means um, we'll explain why that happens in a minute. Um, the other thing you can do is check the condition of the cap. This one's pretty cruddy. This was original equipment, and um, it, it suffered some abuse with heat. And it's just dried out and crusty looking. You want to look for cracks in these gaskets because they're the seals. There's a couple of seals in there, and this is all crudded up and corroded looking. That was the one where the water pump blew up on it. And, uh, I think there's actually a metal ring that's missing on this one. I found it on the ground when I pulled it off. Uh, it's history. Um, then. Uh, so then it used to be you'd buy the green antifreeze. And I'm gonna tell you about this. Remember we said fluids, filters, and gases? Every model making year and trim package seems to have their own special kind of coolant. There's one called Asian Blue, there's Ford has the gold stuff. GM was using that orange junk, which wound up causing more problems than it solved. And then there's the old fashioned green antifreeze that um, the Geo Metro, you're going to hear a little bit of the car, still uses that. Um, so before you add fluids, let's say it's low, before you add fluid to a car, check the owner's manual, which doesn't always tell you, because they're going to tell you to go to Ford to buy it. There are some websites out there that will have cross chart references for which models makes in years use what kind of coolant. It's very important. Same with your um, transmission fluid and power steering fluid and brake fluids. Not so much the brake fluids, but it's not like the old days. It's very complicated. I'm not sure I would even go into uh, uh, like an AutoZone or Advanced Auto and ask. I'd almost go to a dealership and I'd almost just buy it right from the dealer. Um, me, I got you know time on my hands. I'll, I'll look it up all the way in the back of the internet and figure it out. And um, so this is a recovery tank, and you see that recovery tank right there. Now back in the day, when the engine got hot, the radiator cap. You saw those springy little seals would release the pressure so you wouldn't get too much pressure and we used to call that the barf tube and it would just barf out on the pavement and that is what we did back then. So they put these recovery tanks in here which we called the barf tanks and it would, the, instead of just letting it drip out on the pavement it would go into this tank and it would fill the tank up a little bit. Then when the engine would cool down it would siphon it back up into the engine so you never lost it all over the pavement. It's kind of a closed system, but it is vented. Um, if you have this hose has cracks in it, or it's not connected properly, or if the radiator cap's bad, it may not siphon it back up because it's going to leak air in. So what does that mean for maintenance? This recovery tank, they usually have lines on there where it says cold and hot. And if your fluid is in that range, you're good. Um, depending on how, how cold it is. Um, the 
What was the other thing was, so th this one actually, the, the vent to actually comes into the bottom of this one, which makes more sense. I think that's probably wrong, unless they have that thing going all the way down. Now, we've had considered levels. Now, the pressure is in here. Looking in here, and it's, you, all the scum lines up in here, and you're going to get some scum on these systems, so don't judge your coolant by what you find in here. Judge your coolant by what you find under the cap, when the engine's cold. Um, and they'll say right on that radiator cap, do not open when hot. I have a better one for you. Only open when stone cold. Like, you know, it's been sitting out for three hours at least. And on a hot summer day, make it longer. Um, I have, yes, taken the hot shower. And luckily I did not get burned. I don't know why I didn't get burned. I, I opened it up and it went up, hit the hood, and just came down all over me. <laughs> Young single and stupid, right? So, um, but that water is what? 195 degrees, we said? And if the engine's overheated, it's even hotter. It, I've seen live steam, literally live steam coming out of those things. Yes? That's one of the things I've wondered is how do you know when your coolant's down? How do you check? Like, okay. I'm yep. used to the older cars. How yeah, you, you look down a radiator cap. Uh -huh. Okay, now we'll show you, I'll tell you about a couple of phenomena that can happen. So we know that this is a semi closed system and the fuel level, I mean, the fuel level, the coolant level will go up and down. If it gets hot, it goes up. Cools down, it goes down. So if you're in that operating range, you're, you're good. You should check it here once in a while when it's stone cold anyway, for looking for weird contaminants. And I've, I'll tell you another thing that can happen. Let's say there's that air leak I was telling you about. Let's say the water pump has an air leak. Let's say the head gasket has an air leak. What I've found happening is um, this thing would be right there, but it wouldn't be siphoning it back in. It was bleeding out someplace. So let's say the water pump is the bearings in the water pump are loose and the seal and it leaks out and it's a small leak, you don't see it. And eventually the coolant level in the engine goes down, the coolant level in the radiator goes down. But if you just look at this guy, he's just sitting there stupid because it's never getting siphoned out and it's always going to put it in. They, they always do that. And this thing could be almost out of coolant. You're running an engine without coolant pretty much and this thing's looking just you know, nice and happy. Um, so, yeah, you can check it in here, but yeah, you should check it the radiator level too. So, so you can still look in and see the coolant. Yes. Okay. Now, if your car has a cap, the Fords, a lot of Fords, don't. What they did is they put the pressure cap on this guy. Uh -huh. So this is the guy. So on this particular type, you can take the cap off. This this tank is not pressurized, but Ford makes their tanks pressurized and sealed. And that's pretty still, that's, that's a good read in there though, because it's a sealed system. So you can go just by that. There is no radiator cap to look down. You have to put it in here. And they have all kinds of weird plumbing in here where they run the fluid through this tank constantly. And then the tanks go bad because why they're plastic and then you throw it out. And they, I've changed out of many of Ford Taurus recovery tanks. It's, and people have them in stock because that's a common thing. It's dumb. Um, so we're talking about that head gasket thing, right? See that little tan thing on top of there? Well, that's the engine block and then the head goes on top of that. It's like the engine has two halves. If you overheat your engine on the new cars, the heads will warp. That gasket will never seal right again and you have to get the head rebuilt and shaved down. And that costs... I did my Geo Metro for 500 bucks and I did all the labor myself. It's 300 bucks of uh, machine shop, $200 in parts. It only has three cylinders. If you have a six, double it. If the mechanic has to do it, add a thousand dollars to it. Yeah, you don't want to overheat your engine. Name of that game. Um, and, and if you're lucky, that's all you did to it. I think when the Toyota Camry water pump died, and my daughter panicked, and she didn't shut it down soon enough, I, I think we have issues with that car. You want to buy a Toyota? <laughs> so I, the, 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 the coolant's a little sludgy looking. But um, that's the thing too, when your temperature gauge goes way up, like I told you with the alternator, Pull over as soon as you can safely. If your temperature gauge goes up and it starts, in, and it says, "Hey, temperature's too high by the gauge or an idiot light." Ideally, shut the engine off immediately. But now, pull over first safely. I mean, if you can shut the engine off and coast safely, I'm not telling you, just don't get killed. Um, but that may save your engine. It doesn't take much to overheat them and ruin them forever. But you know, pull over first. Buy another car. Don't worry about it. Um, I have a Toyota, I'll sell you. So, um, 
So in the meantime, so how does the heater work? Well, that coolant gets pumped back here, and uh, there's a heater control valve, but I don't see too many of them anymore. And it, there's a radiator, just like those old steam radiators, and well, the baseboard radiators, they, they, have, they have water going through them in the house. That's all it is, a glorified baseboard radiator. Got the little blower motor, goes out your defroster vents, and out your foot vents, whatever. And the air conditioner, they have it in there too. And then the air comes from the outside of the car, blows through there, gets heated, goes into your car. There's a thing called a blend door. So when you adjust the, the um, when you adjust the hot and the cold, all it's really doing is allowing how much cold air or how much hot air is going to go through your HVAC system here and get into the cabin of the car. And um, so when your air conditioner doesn't work, don't condemn the air conditioner. See so if that blend door is working properly. There's a thirty dollar part from a Ford Taurus called a blend door motor, and it would you turn the knob on the Taurus and it had a little electric connector. It has a little electric motor in there and gears. They always wear out and strip out. There's a big door that goes hot, goes cold. It's a, it's a vent control, and that's why the air conditioner didn't work. It was just something stupid like that. Um, you know, what are we doing here? Where are we? Freeze plugs. Okay, so not only do you have to have the right type of antifreeze in there, you have to have the right ratio in there. Um, you have, they'll tell you on the bottle if it's like 50% water, 50% coolant, it usually takes you down about negative 20. You know, if you live in Wisconsin, you're probably going to run up a lot richer than that. If you do not put the proper mixture in there and it gets colder than the coolant would be rated for, the coolant inside the engine block will freeze, and what happens is the liquids when they freeze, they expand, they'll crack the block in half, or they put these little free freeze plugs in here that will allow the water to blast out of this freeze plug. That's worth about 35 cents, but on that four Taurus, they had them between the engine and the transmission, so it's 35 cents for the part and 700 bucks to put it in. Name of the game, keep your coolant. Look at oh, so what you can do to check your coolant uh, for the proper um, mixture is they sell, um, they look like eyedroppers that you would pull up some uh, coolant out of maybe the recovery tank or out of the radiator cap when it's cold and the little four balls would be floating inside of it and I think like if three of them were floating you're good to the negative 20 or some of them have fancy gauges. You used to be able to get them for like a dollar and a half. Now they get these fancy ones that cost 30 bucks. Um, I do not know where mine is. I would have brought it otherwise. I, I can never find it. I was breaking, dropping, losing. Um, so for cooling system, really, you just want to check your level. Well, let's, again, filters, fluids, and gases. Check your level. Check the condition of it. Um, and uh, make sure you have the right type in there. And if you want to go so far as to check the uh, proper mix level there, get a, get a coolant testing gauge. Any more? The systems are so reliable. Uh, the days of the tune-up are going away. Um, and I'll tell you another thing too. It doesn't take a low, much of a, a low loss of a level to really tune things up, especially in the Japanese cars. I'll speak for the Hondas, the Suzukis. What's the other thing we owned? The Toyotas. You lose a little bit of coolant, you're almost running the system dry. They don't hold as much as the big American cars used to. I mean, they used to have those really big tanks on top of the radiators. Those days are gone. Everything is minimalized. Any questions about cooling? So uh, it looks like it doesn't take any extra gas to turn the heat up in your car. That's correct. Yeah, the, the engine produces more heat than you're ever going to need. And getting rid of the heat in an engine is a big engineering problem. Um, that engine's more than happy to throw heat back in that uh, heat record. There's another trick too. If your engine is overheating, that's why they tell you turn off the air conditioner because that takes a load off the engine. Drive slowly, keep the car moving, and turn your heater on because that's going to be like an auxiliary radiator to blast more heat. That's if you're nursing along, you just kind of, you know, if it goes full bore overheat, like if your water pump fails, that you're dead in the water. Just pull it over before you blow the engine up. And then um, the other trick is. If the coolant level is low and you're not getting heat, you won't get heat out of your heater, and you see your temperature gauge going up and it's blowing cold air, coolant level's low. You got air bubbles in there. Another trick is 
leave the heater on and rev the engine. That way you may not have enough water to cool it, but if you take what water you do have or coolant that you do have and run it through, it'll dissipate it. And it might get you home. But like I said, if it starts going up and it's at a point of no return where you can't get that gauge to come down, shut it off. Shut it off or blow it up. Um, suspension, there's nothing you really can do for maintenance on suspensions. They, um, they don't care about the cost yet. There's one. Okay. Remember shock absorbers? Mm -hmm. Now they, they incorporate them into the springs themselves and they're called struts. So there's the shock. You can see the tube in there. And the shock is just a piston that goes through some hydraulic oil. So that so the tires bounce. There used to be a commercial tires bounce. And you had all these tires that would bounce down the road. And the idea is you don't want your tires bouncing up and down because they're like basketballs. And so to dampen it out, they had shock absorbers, which I think is not exactly a good name for them. And as the tire would try to bounce up and down, and the spring was not helping out either because springs go boing, that's what they do. Um, they would have these shock absorbers in here, which is a hydraulic piston going through oil, and that would dampen the vibration. So that's why your tires are bounced. If the fluid leaks out of these things, your tire is going to bounce. So what's the maintenance you can do? One, if you feel your tire is bouncing, you probably want to see, gee, maybe you got a blown shock or a blown strut. You can look at these things, and if they're dripping with oil, you know you got a bad one. And by the way, that will not pass inspection. Another thing that can happen is these coil springs will break. That used to be unheard of, but the newer cars, they do that. Um, four sources were, um, tell them I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> and um, they, um, they, that won't pass inspection, obviously, if the coil springs broke, and you can lose control of the car, and blah, blah, blah. The struts with the gas, I'm sorry, with the uh, oil in them, keeping the wheels from bouncing, obviously gives you better control of the car. And um, when we discuss tires, we'll show, we'll, I'll show you what tires look like when the struts are bad, because it will damage the tires. Um, Suspension-wise, there's, there's nothing else to it. Uh, they have these dust boots up here to keep that, you can see the gap there in that, in that strut. And, you don't want dust getting down into the hydraulics because it's, it's a piston with a seal, but everything leaks. Nothing's, nothing's perfectly tight. The dust boots crack and fall apart. Don't worry about it. They're junk. Um, the other thing is um, they recommend replacing them every so many thousand miles. I, I never had. I, I wait for them to fail. Most people do. Um, it's, like, it's like the question, the, the old saying goes, what's in your wallet? You can go broke maintaining these things. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so you do get new struts. You can buy just the gas charge, uh, I'm sorry, it's just a hydraulic uh, shock absorber, and the shop will buy that, and they'll take this spring off it, and they'll take this mounting plate off it, and they'll just tear the whole thing down and rebuild it there in the shop. Not cost effective. They have factories that do that, mass production wise, a lot cheaper. Because by the time the, you save the money with not buying a new coil spring and not buying the new uh, bearing plate and not buying the new jouncers, the labor at the shop for 100 bucks an hour is going to eat all that up and all you got is just one new part. They make these strut systems now where it all comes together. It's all one piece. It's a new spring, new shock, new bearing plate, new dust boots, uh, new jouncers, and it comes right out of the box. The mechanic just has to pop the old one out and it's, they're really easy to do. And pop, put some new in, and you got all new stuff, and you just drive away happy. And when you get them replaced, depending on your model making year, you may, have, may or may not have to get the wheels aligned. Um, that's up to your mechanic to tell you. So, really, all you can look for on them is are they leaking, or if the tires have a funny wear, which we'll discuss later. Any questions about Mr. Struts? Very easy. Um, then, um, we talked about, there, there's also on here things called leaf springs and torsion bars. I don't know that anybody uses torsion bars anymore. Chrysler was big on that. Um, leaf springs, you've probably seen the trucks, they have those big heavy leaves that are shaped like this. The old, the old, um, what are they, the old uh, horse-drawn wagons would have those leaf springs. They're usually on the back of pickup trucks. Most modern cars don't have them anymore. 
there's no maintenance involved with that. If they're, if they're making noise, if anything's making noise, you know, get it checked. They, have, they used to have rubber bushings in a little bit dry rot. Um, if you do hear noises too, these bearing plates wear out up here. That, that's where the car itself rests on. You'll hear them when you turn a wheel in a parking lot, you hear this grinding, crunching noise. But that's very, very rare that, that, that they go bad. So the next thing uh, was brakes. Um, once again, really no maintenance because um, they just wear out and replace them. One thing you can maintain on brakes though is the, uh, and it's really not a maintenance issue, it's more of a keep an eye on it issue. Um, we all know what that is. That's the master cylinder and it's generally located Right there, if you have the steering wheel, it's right there on the other side of the firewall. So it's right on the firewall of the car. Um, and you'll see some steel lines, like steel hoses coming out of it. And it'll say min and max, and it gets brake fluid. You can usually look through the clear plastic and see what the level is. You open it up, don't get dirt in it. Make sure you put the right fluid in there or you're done. And if the car is very, very old, it's not a bad idea to get it flushed out every so many years. You're, once again, go to the owner's manual. I always wind up flushing mine out because my cars are so old that their brake lines wind up rusting out and we get a free flush and fill right there in the parking lot. Well, hopefully in the parking lot. Um, they generally don't go bad anymore, these master cylinders. Uh, if it does, your pedal goes to the floor. If you don't have enough fluid in there, your pedal goes to the floor. Because every time you press on the, on the uh, brake pedal, it pushes a piston in there and it pressurizes the brake fluid out of these things that go to all four wheels. And hopefully the pressure is even on all four wheels. They, they have little valves and regulators that make sure that happens. And um, that's how brakes work. The, um, there's, like I said, nothing to maintain on it other than just making sure the level's good and make sure it's clean and it shouldn't smell like varnish. If it's been sitting around a long time, it's gonna smell like varnish. The best way to learn how it's supposed to smell and not smell is go to a known good one and see what it smells like. And, and there's nothing worse uh, smellier than old brake fluid. So what happens with the brakes eventually though is, so you got a rotor. You ever seen these things behind the wheels? But they're usually nice and shiny. This one's not. You don't want to have a car like this. You have issues. If the rotor's not shiny, it means the brakes aren't working really. This guy fits over it. It's got the hose coming off of it. The hose goes through a bunch of other steel lines up to that guy eventually. And these hoses, which you really can't see unless you get under the car, they can get cracks in them. They can fill up with, grud, uh, with, with crud and keep the brakes from releasing because it's like a one-way valve and you'll get a dragging brake and it could just be the hose. It could be this piston here. There's, if you can see that piston, if that gets pressurized, that piston comes out. So when that piston comes out, it will squeeze the two pads that are not installed here against that rotor and it will slow the car down. The pads are, a pair of them someplace. So it works just like a bicycle brake. Exactly, yep. Yeah. And you ever notice like, um, when a bicycle, you squeeze the brakes and you go It's because bicycles are junk, that's one reason. The other is the, if the wheel's not true, it's gonna grab, 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 grab. These guys, depending on the model making year, some cars will have a tendency to do it, these guys will warp. And then you'll feel it through the brake pedal going thump, 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 thump. If you're my daughter, you won't feel it. She's a software engineer. And I said, you know, these rotors are bad. Oh, they're fine, the brakes are fine. I, said, nah, I can't stand driving this thing home to change the oil. And so I, I threw new rotors on it, I couldn't deal with it. Um, there was a set of brake pads in here someplace. Ah, here they are. So these guys, these came out of my focus. They, just like bicycle brakes, they sit on there. There's all kinds of framework holding this stuff together. Um, and then that 
assembly for the hose I showed you. Just squeezes them on there. And as you can see, these are very, very thin. That wear line, oh, that's all messy. They're, um, if, once that line disappears, they're too thin. And once they're too thin, they tend not to have the heat dissipation properties. And so you can also see that one's got cracks in it. That's, that one overheated. So this one overheated, it's got cracks. That Once that line disappears, once that line disappears, it's, they're worn out. And you see they're very thin. When they're new, the, the pad part of it is about as thick as that entire assembly there. They're very, very thick. The other thing that happens is if you wear all that shoe material off, then the metal bracket will touch the metal rotor and ruin the rotor. And um, rotors used to be cheap, they're not cheap anymore. Um, I think uh, for that Taurus, they wanted um, $100 a piece for, for Taurus. Daddy's not doing it. I got them online. <laughs> I got them for 50 a piece, which is about what they should cost. It's a hunk of metal in the shape of a circle. It's a glorified pie plate. pie plate. Give me a break. No, no pun intended. So, you. <laughs> now, I said that once, actually, but, and it was no pun intended. 63 Dodge, pulled into a Wawa, paddled onto the floor, no brakes. I looked over my brain and he says, Go, oh, God, give me a break. And I didn't even realize I was pulling a pun. <laughs> and, uh, and the mechanic drove it from King Impression to Malvern without brakes. Mm -hmm. People were tougher back then. Um, so you can see these things through the slots in your wheels on some cars. You can put your finger in there. Never put your finger in there after the car's been running. Those brake rotors will burn your skin right down to the bone. And um, we'll talk about exhaust pipes later, doing the same thing. And, um, and you can tell when they're going, you know, but they Don't may they pass and Pardon me? Don't they get squeaky? Ah, uh, that's, that's a day late and a dollar short when they do. Those sensors are, are junk. Okay. Yeah, that, I had, um, now maybe they're better now, I don't know. I'm, I'm very cynical. Um, I remember when they first came out with those sensors, I was on a, uh, like an 84 Chevy Celebrity, something like that. And um, they started squeaking, and about two or three miles later, I went through an uh, intersection sideways because the brakes were shot. So, so, so I started looking at brakes at that point. That back in the day when the only thing you really ever saw were drum brakes. You know, yeah, you still, still see drum brakes. These are disc brakes, by the way. I don't have any drum brakes with me. Um, they're the ones that look like a, a dog dish and they had the shoes that would expand out into it. They're very inefficient, ineffective, they're hard to adjust, and they tend to work and give you that wobble. Ain't nothing in the world like a car with four-wheel discs. They're, they're the best. Um, so just check your brake fluid. If you can see in there, fine. If you see metal, sparkly, powdery things all over your wheels, that means you're probably grinding away that rotor. You're probably, you're probably metal on metal. You may not feel it. You'll hear it. You'll hear like a grinding noise. You ever hear it sounds like sandpaper when you stop on them? When the shoes were just totally shot? You'll, you'll kind of know. Um, you know, the, you know, like kids, and I'm sure you all the same. They don't call on the phone anymore. They just text you. If I get the phone call, it's making a noise. Yeah. They don't know, but they know there's something to be called in about. Um, Let's see, so if you pass inspection and you have another year, the brakes may not last another year. The reason being is at that time they were thick enough, but a good mechanic will say they're thick enough now and you may want to just have them looked at in six months or less. And those I replaced, I mean they would probably, technically they would pass, uh, not, not this one though. I'm, it was before a trip and I said, you know, I'm throwing the shoes on it. Um, so I didn't get the last bit of use out of them. You know, the weather's nice. I'll change them today. Uh, any questions about brakes? Ready. Uh, once again, having to do with fluids. Um, brakes, brakes, brakes. Okay, master cylinder proportioning valve. Like I said, they have these funny valves that make sure everybody gets done evenly. The, oh, there's a power brake booster on these things. So. Why is it, it used to be you had to stand on the pedal to get the car to stop. Now it's just effortless. And they have a big, um, I don't know if they show you on here. You gotta show me? No, come on. How about that? 
there's a big thing. So this is where, I lied to you, this is not on the firewall. It is on a firewall, but there's another piece between this thing and the firewall. So you have the firewall, you have this big looking, man, it's like a flying saucer, but it's thick and puffy. And then you have this bolted on in front of it. And it's the power brake booster. So when you press on a pedal, it makes the booster push on the piston in the master cylinder. How does that work? It has a vacuum line going to it. So when the engine is, is the pistons are going up and down, uh, when the piston is doing an intake stroke, it's sucking air into the engine. That creates a vacuum. And what they do is they take advantage of that vacuum. They'll run a lot of systems on the car with the vacuum of that engine. And one of the things that's very important is the power, power brake system, whereby they'll take a rubber hose like this, plug it into this vacuum source because they'll, they'll create this vacuum it's complicated, I'm not going to go there. They go to the vacuum booster for the brakes, and in your brake effort, when you push the pedal, you're just really controlling how much vacuum is applied to that piston. It's, it's, remember the, the story with the two horses trying to pull the spear apart, and it was held by a vacuum, and the two horses couldn't do it in, their, in grade school, and they were teaching you the power of a vacuum. Vacuum is very powerful. All right, so where's the problem? The vacuum hose. Once again, check your hoses for cracks. If your engine is idling fast, you might have a vacuum leak because it's sucking in air, it's running leaner, a leaner engine will spin faster, it won't have more power, but it'll spin faster. It'll probably throw a code too. My geometric would not throw a code. I was just, um, I had to find that. I knew it was, it was idling fast, it didn't throw a code because it wasn't smart enough. But I narrowed it down to the power brake booster hose. And it was the last one I looked for because I said, I already replaced that seven years ago, but <laughs> they went bad in seven years. So yeah, that's an important thing. Uh, check, so check your hoses, because once again, fluids, filters, and um, uh, what was the other one was? Fluids, filters, and, 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 and yes. gases. gases. And in this case, it's the inverse of a gas. It's, um, it's a vacuum. All right, so the next thing we want to go to is steering. All right. Um, Power steering, got a power steering pump. And there's two ways to check your power steering pump. Once again, that's run by the belt. Got to keep your belt sloping now, right? Uh, power steering pump, got a pulley on it like everybody else. They leak, they go bad. They have power steering hoses, check them for dry rot. I just put a couple of those in that Toyota. And um, so, you know, it's an old car, it's got oil drips and stuff. Yeah, the oil drips are coming from somewhere. Try to track them down. It could be something important. It could just be you have to add oil to that car a lot of times. But if you have a hose that's going bad, especially a power steering hose, that's not a good thing to lose. That's the last thing I'd rather lose on a car. I'd rather lose the brakes. I'd rather lose the suspension. I'd, I'd, at least the steering, you can control what you're going to crash into. If you lose the steering, you're just going for a ride. So. Um, it has a pump, and it also has a reservoir. It's separate from the pump. Now, the four tours, they have the pump and the reservoir are in the same place. The point of the story is, at one point, you need to find it and check it. If you have a setup like this, it has, it's probably pretty clear. As the car gets older, you get grungy, the plastic isn't clear like it used to be. It whites out. Um, so they'll have a safe zone, and in the case of the power steering, they're going to say it's safe when it's cold and safe when it's hot, because fluids expand and contract. If it has a cap and a dipstick, same deal, they're going to have a hot reading and a cold reading. Use your judgment. If it's all foamy, that means you're sucking air into your system, um, and it'll suds up like, a, like putting the wrong detergent in your dishwasher. It'll be a comedy, except you want to be steering. And, in, and you hear that whining noise too. They make a lot of whining the power strings do. Um, where can it suck in the air? On the Ford Taurus. One of the hoses going into the pump had a little O-ring that went bad. Now, this is a big O-ring. It was much smaller. And it cost me a lot of money for the guy to find it. <laughs> and I couldn't find it. Because he had just replaced the steering rack. I figured out it's under warranty. <laughs> he found out, well, not only was the steering rack bad, but that was bad too. This one has a fluid cooler. You may or may not have it. In which case, you'll find a leak coming out from under your bumper. It's like, well, there's no steering parts on the bumper. Hey, maybe it's that guy. You know. Um, 
this is a rack and pinion system. You, you spin the steering wheel. It's got a little gear in there to, that, that rides on the, the rack, and the rack has a bunch of teeth on the top of it. It just moves the rack this way and that way, and it pulls the wheels left to right. There's a sensor in here that, it's not a sensor, but there's a valve in there that controls how much fluid so in other words, if you're just going straight and the valve is in a neutral position, it doesn't push the wheels one way or the other. You turn a wheel, you actually bump into a valve on some of the systems, and it gives you a little bit of fluid to nudge the wheels. And as it nudges the wheels, the valve straightens out unless you continue to turn. That's how power steering works. That valve can go bad. I've never seen one go bad. But they will leak here at these little boots. You can see those little boots there. And um, I don't think I have one of those. And uh, so that's uh, one thing to look for. Power steering fluid is generally red. Um, and once again, no, I may have lied. That's transmission fluid. No, it's generally clear. But they're, I know like Honda has their own kind. Everybody's got their own kind of fluids. So always watch out for that. Um, so they'll leak at the pump, they'll leak at the boots, and they'll leak at the hoses. And that's where you check it. On the Ford Taurus, it's right at the pump. The dipstick comes right out of the pump itself. That's just two places to look. Um, like I said, the, the bad things are low fluid level, foaming fluid, or if the wheel is chattering like this on you, you definitely have low fluid. And it's grinding and groaning and sort of a whirring sound when you turn the wheel. Yeah, that's a fluid issue or a pump issue. It's, it's, a, it's an issue. Any questions about? Steering, the power steering anyway. Uh, I'll go into a little bit about some other stuff here. I got um, where's that thing? Uh, remember we were talking about the police. Okay, here's one. Um, back in the day, you had to adjust the belts to make them tight. Now they have a spring-loaded pulley, and um, these guys go bad either. The pulley gets loose, and you can see this one. This one has. Remember saying about the skid marks at the end of the runway? This guy's this guy had had some issues. I forget what I ate. No, I yanked this out of that Toyota. That's right. That's when the water pump went bad. And um, I don't know if this pulley itself is bad, but that other one was. But anyway, it's been marking that pulley up, and it's probably not a good sign. And so this is a spring-loaded tensioner. No, this this didn't come out of that car. This came out of my Chrysler. This is the one I was. This is the reason why I was on the Long Island Expressway, changing the <laughs> changing the belt. Um, that car used to squeal so badly when you would go down Bridge Street in Phoenixville where they get the big tall apartments now. It was it was embarrassing because it would bounce off the it was so loud. I finally replaced all the pulleys with some custom jobs that Gates made and that solved the problem. It was inherently evil from the design when it came out of the factory. And it would manifest itself ten years later. Anyway. Paul need to start wrapping up soon. Um, we're going to eight or eight thirty. Eight. Oh yeah, we close oh, at eight. Nuts. Yes. I thought another half an hour. Um, we can skip wheels and bearings because you don't got that. Uh, they go bad, they go bad. These things called tie rod ends. I know I got a tie rod end in here. Yeah. We were talking about suspensions earlier. This thing has a thing called a ball joint. And um, this part right down in there. And when these ball joints go bad, you'll lose your alignment. And those also, they can snap out. Um, the PT Cruisers had a problem where the whole front end would just fall off the car and you'd have a bad day. Because it wasn't the PT Cruisers' fault, it was the post factory parts that the PT were putting in them. Tri Flow Teflon based lubricant, great for door hinges. Also good for locks, latches. Firearms and bicycle chains, and the cables in the bicycles. It's got, it actually pushes the moisture out. It's a good thing to have. Um, bearings and butts. We we're talking about the ball joint. This guy here would actually, that ball joint would fit up in here, and as you can see, it would be there, and then the strut goes to this, and this is the, um, where the tie rod would come in and steers your car. These bearings go, can go bad. You'll hear a grinding noise. There's no maintenance involved. You just replace them as they wear out. 
Um, front axle, front wheel drive has these things called. Um, yeah, see this. I do want to show you this because this you can check yourself. Steering, come on. Wrong way. Brakes, we did that. Suspension, did we do that? No. Transmission drivetrain, here we go. So you get your transmission sitting here, and here's the axle that spins that wheel. That drive shaft spins that wheel. And as you can see, there's a boot here, a boot there, a boot there, and a boot there. And the reason for that is as the car hits bumps, you have to be able to do this. As the car steers, you have to be able to do that. And you get these rubber boots. That's the Achilles heel. Look, have you look at this one here. If they're blowing grease all over the place, they will smoke inspection. They will eventually fail. You won't lose control. You might just not have any drive. But you see that boot there is all cracking up. These are called the bellows. Now, they could just replace the bellows. It's not worth it. It's like the struts. Don't pay the guy to rebuild it. Just throw the whole thing in there and shotgun it. These are made by Cardone, C-A-R-D-O-N. Um, Oh, the replacements for this one was made by Cardone. Now, uh, if you ever want to replace your axles, get Cardone, they were the best. Right? A lot of other issues went away. Wipers. So you what you for in your wipers. And it will flunk you for inspection for this. And the Pridenia. These things are expensive nowadays. They were probably even more. Luckily, like Arnold Zone and stuff, they'll install them for you. What goes bad? Ah, wow, this is actually a bad one. This is what you look for, is the ends cracking on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that will flunk the car for inspection. So I just check once in a while. That's, that's the Achilles heel of wiper blades nowadays. Oh, yeah. I mean, it looks perfectly normal, right? It yeah. might even wipe nice. It probably leaves a streak right there. Who cares, right? But no, they'll flunk it right there. I actually had a bad one. Last time, I think I couldn't find one. Then, electrical, don't fool around. Tires, this is important. Wheels and bearings, expensive. They're all pre-lubricated, there's nothing you can do about it. Tire wear, if you're wearing out the shoulders of the tire, you probably don't have enough air in it. If you're wearing out the center, you got too much air in it. The placard on the side of the car and the door pillar, they tell you how many pounds put in, or a minute, how many pounds put in. I always put more in it because we're Americans and we have junk in our cars and we just, the more weight, the more inflation you need. Otherwise, you'll wear them out like this you don't have enough inflation on them, they flex more, they overheat. Drywall, the sidewalls dry, rot, and crack more often. If you're really towing a trailer and stuff, max them out. If they're rated for 44 pounds, you're towing and getting every, all the luggage in there. If it's rated for 44 pounds on the sidewall, put, put 44. I put 42. I run around town around here with 38 because of all the chuck holes we have. Um, if you're wearing it off on the side here like that, you have a camber issue. That's an alignment issue because the tire is tilted too much. That's okay if you're a race car and you can put five sets of tires on in, in a race, but you know these things cost money. If they're feathered, that could be that um, the wheels aren't aligned as well, probably a toe issue. And if they have a cupping in them, remember we talked about the shocks being shot and then tires bouncing up and down? It'll, they'll find a frequency, a, a resonating frequency where they'll bounce up and down and you'll get like cups worn out, usually on the inner tread. Um, so that's the thing to look for. Look, they should wear evenly. Adjust your inflation. If you see that it's you know doing this, put more in it. If you see it's doing that, put less in it. It's to each his own. Cars, every car is different. And the placards on the side of the door, of the door pillar are meant to make it ride nice out of the showroom. That's what I've been told. Uh, dry rot cracks. That tire will fly apart. It'll destroy the fender. It'll destroy your door. It'll destroy all your sheet metal down inside your car. See what happen. Um, Sidewall dry rot. That's dry rot. That's not from overheating. Usually you get some spider cracks in here and that's fairly normal. But that's bad. That's been sitting out in the sun. That's the, that's the thing you'd find out of a car from sitting in a junkyard for five years. That's called an onion. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see the bulge in the sidewall? Yes. And that's where your kid says, I didn't hit anything. And then when you look very closely, you'll see the, the cut marks on the wheel and the wheel cover. It's like, yeah, you did. You hit something. <laughs> that doesn't happen. This is a broken belt, probably. That could have been from an impact, or it could have been, you see a little scuff mark there, you know. Uh, or it could be, um, uh, it could be uh, just a bad tire. I, I will only buy super name brand, Cooper, Firestone, Uniroyal. Um, 
Check your air your tires, that's a good thing. Well, I don't know how to do that, right? Sorry. Sim sim okay. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. The simpler to gauge, the better. Electrical, it's a nightmare. Um, you, you find If you have stuff like your, your windshield wipers aren't working right, or if you turn on one thing and the blinkers come on, it could be a bad ground. If you look at the lift of the hood and there's like a the bar of metal that goes across the front of the engine compartment, and you'll see wires that are bolted into the frame, check them for corrosion. Wiggle them around. Give them a little yank. They'll pop right out sometimes. They're so corroded. Have something, yeah, make sure you're home when you do this. <laughs> you know, because um, HVAC, we, we covered that. The air conditioning, um, it's, uh, there's no maintenance in that. It works or it don't. Um, you can have them top off the well once in a while, or you can buy those little cans of Freon. If you work on this stuff, wear heavy gloves, because if the Freon leaks out while you're working on it, it'll give you frostbite instantly. Um, it's the, you know, it, this, all this stuff with the blower motor, that was all with the heat we covered earlier. Really no maintenance, except for the cabin, that's the end of the line there. The cabin filter, so the air cleaner has a filter, the air filter, and your HVAC system also has a thing called a cabin filter on some cars. They're expensive. The easy ones come out through the glove box. Ford, in its infinite wisdom, means you've got to take the windshield wipers apart and get it sometimes and you have to invasively get in it through the front of the top of the cowling of the place behind the hood. Any questions about that stuff? Can I ask you a quick question, which is part of sure, what I'm Sure, absolutely, thinking. yep. So my transmission fluid is dark, it's uh, not red. Not good. And I was going to take it in and have it changed it. Or something. Yep. No. Not but not everything I look like online said that you got to be really careful with that because so I'm afraid to do it. I just it now. found out why. I just because I have a Honda that says thou shalt change it every so many thousand miles yeah. or thou will be an evil car and it's going to trash itself. Talk to uh, Superior Collision. Also, he runs the transmission shop there now. A guy named Matt. And I talked with him and his mechanic for about half an hour. And I got these four cars. I got the Taurus. Yeah. Sleep, should I leave sleeping? No, it's lie. I got the Toyota, and, and I got the Focus. The Focus I'll do myself. The Honda, I want you to do it because, you know, I do a lot of work. I don't do transmissions. And he explained to me what the problem is. is So if you could just drain the fluid and put new fluid in there, right. you're probably going to get away with it. You pull the pan out and wipe all the sludge off nice and clean, and maybe even see if the filter is right there and clean that out and put it back together, you're probably going to get away with it. He says, the one thing you don't want to do is flush the system out with the pressurizing, because whatever sludge that you can't clean out that's in there someplace is going to get floating that's, around, and yeah. you know, the filter may catch it, but it's going to get in the valve body. And once it gets in the valve body, it's not going to shift so that's and true out the that. transmission goes, and they've got to be, what, three grand and up now. Because I looked online. And it said, so uh, can I just change the fluid? It basically said, don't do the filter I'm because gonna, I'm not going to give you an opinion. All I'm just going to tell you what the guy told me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's better off late, sleeping as long as lie. Um, okay. See what the manual says. Ask Matt. He's seen. He's one of the seen them. Uh, Matt at Superior uh, Collision up on Mara Road, the Unburgeon, that area. Oh yeah. The big farm area with the windmill. Okay. They just, they just took the windmill down. They're fixing it. Um, it made me afraid to do it. I just yeah, I, I, um, I understand that. I wanted to do some of mine, but I don't know. Geometric was manual transmission. I'd drop it out. Mm -hmm. It would take 15 minutes. Oh, it's just 90 weight. You know, I wish just, I could get a clutch. It's just 90 weight. Get her. That's a thing in the past. All right. I guess that wraps it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Hey, you can ask me questions you want backing up if, if uh, Mark doesn't mind. You're welcome. There's a lot to cover there. Hopefully some insightful stuff. Um, like I said, it just boils down to fluids, filters, and gases. It's part of the Medicare program. Mm -hmm. And aren't we sick of those commercials? I am. <laughs> Pardon.